Good afternoon, uh, distinguished guests and colleagues, and thank you for joining the Law Library of Congress and the United States Court for the 2022 Supreme Court Fellows Program Annual Lecture. My name is Aslihan Bulut, and I have the honor of serving as the Law Librarian of Congress. It is my true pleasure to send the greetings from the beautiful Coolidge Auditorium of the Library of Congress's Jefferson Building to both our in-person audience and all of you watching us on your screens today. And before I make the official introductions, let me just say a couple of words about this wonderful event today and its hosts. The Law Library of Congress serves as the nation's custodian of a legal and legislative collection of nearly three million items from all countries and legal systems around the world. Our skilled staff, both American trained attorneys and law librarians, provide research assistance and reference services on United States federal and state legal issues. Our foreign legal specialists are a very diverse group of foreign trained attorneys who provide information, research, and analysis to all three branches of government. Our team is responsible for developing the collection for more than 300 legal systems and foreign and international jurisdictions, as well as the US states and territories in all formats. I would like to take this opportunity to let you know that the Law Library has launched a whole series of free webinars. The webinars cover how to conduct legal research in US case law, federal statutes, and federal regulations as well as foreign and comparative law that brings you up to date on legal developments around the world. Actually, we have a full year of free law related events planned for you. So to learn more about our webinars, projects and events, please sign up for the Law Library's news and events email list on loc.gov slash subscribe or visit the Law Library's Legal Research Institute at law.gov. Whenever we have a US Supreme Court justice attend a Library of Congress event, we attract a record-breaking audience. But it's not just in person, however, that the Supreme Court justices draw crowds at the library. Year after year, the Supreme Court papers and the manuscript division are among the library's most frequently used collections. The papers make up the largest Supreme Court documents collection in the US, and um, this collection includes handwritten letters, memos, journals, draft opinions, and conference notes, and brings a steady stream of scholars, journalists, students, and researchers to the manuscript reading room. Also, the Law Library of Congress is one of 10 depositories that maintains a print collection of the US Supreme Court records and briefs. So I, I invite all of you to visit the library's web pages and explore our digital collections. While our collections and expertise reach across all points of our country and the globe and span from print to digital and everything in between, for today's event, we have partnered with our next door neighbor, who happens to be the highest court in the country, to host a Supreme Court Fellows Program Lecture. The Supreme Court Fellows Program was founded in 1973 and offers mid-career professionals, recent law school graduates, and doctoral degree holders from the law and political science fields an opportunity to broaden their understanding of the judicial system through exposure to federal court administration. This is a year-long appointment in Washington, D.C. at one of four federal judiciary agencies, Supreme Court of the United States, Administrative Office of the U.S. Courts, Federal Judicial Center, and the U.S. Sentencing Commission. The fellows report that the collegial experience creates bonds and professional friendships that continue throughout their careers. And without further ado, I would like to invite to the stage Mr. Jeffrey P. Manier, Executive Director of the Supreme Court Fellows Program and Counselor to the Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court, who will be moderating the conversation with our guest of honor today, the US Supreme Court Associate Justice, Honorable Stephen Breyer. Justice Breyer. <laughs> Thank you. 
Justice Breyer is a graduate at Stanford, Oxford, and Harvard Law School. He taught law for many years as a professor at Harvard Law School and at the Kennedy School of Government. He has also worked as a Supreme Court law clerk for Justice Arthur Goldberg, a Justice Department lawyer in the Antitrust Division, an Assistant Watergate Special Prosecutor, and Chief Counsel of the Senate Judiciary Committee. In 1980, he was appointed to the U.S. Court of Appeals for the First Circuit by President Carter, becoming Chief Judge in 1990. In 1994, he was appointed a Supreme Court Justice by President Clinton. He has written many, many books and articles about administrative law, economic regulation, and constitutional law. His latest book is titled The Authority of the Court and the Peril of Politics. We are so glad to have him with us today. Justice Breyer, it's an honor. Mr. Muneer, the floor is yours. Thank you all. Thank you, you Aslan. It's a great pleasure to be back at the Coolidge Auditorium uh, where we've held our past Supreme Court Fellows events. And it's a special delight to have Justice Breyer to join us for a conversation today. Uh, Justice Breyer has a distinguished record on the court, but on top of his day job, he has also compiled an impressive list of books that he's authored. A stack of them are available right here. His most recent book is called The Authority of the Court and the Peril of Politics. And we'll be talking about that book a little bit later. Uh, all of these books are available at the Supreme Court Historical Society uh, online or at their gift shop. Uh, but before we talk about the books, I'd like to uh, just uh, go back to the issue of the justice's day job. And uh, justice, as you heard, Justice Breyer first uh, came to the Supreme Court in 1964 as a law clerk for Justice Goldberg. And he joined the court 30 years later. Uh, so he has an insider's perspective that spans 60 years of the court. And that's about a quarter of the court's uh, history. And so I'd like to begin by just asking you about uh, what changes you've seen in the court, uh, in its culture, uh, in the personalities that are there, and the way it goes about doing its work. Well, uh, there, there are, of course, a change of personalities. Bar Byron White said, with every new appointment, it's a new court as the interpersonal relations and how it all functions as a unit change. Uh, of course, that's changed. Let's see who was there, if I can remember everybody. When I was a law clerk, Warren was the chief justice. Yes. Uh, uh, Brennan and it was, had the office next to ours, and Goldberg had uh, uh, where uh, uh, Justice Kavanaugh is now. And uh, there was Potter Stewart and uh, John Harlan. And Douglas was at the end, just uh, where uh, uh, Justice Barrett is now. And uh, Douglas was, uh, Goldberg would send me down to talk to his, uh, somebody in his office when something unpleasant was going on, because he didn't want to face Justice Douglas, I guess. But <laughs> nonetheless, uh, and on the other side was Byron White, was on the other side there. And uh, Black was in the other corner. And uh, oh, it was a great court. But they had a mission. That was, that I think was the difference. I mean, I'm not saying, look. Uh, in 54, the court decided Brown. And we all know what happened in 55, nothing. And 56, and then 57, it gradually started, and there were the Freedom Riders, and, and uh, uh, but the, and there was Martin Luther King, and, and things gradually began to change, but the key word is gradual. And when you saw how Jim Crow uh, and segregation was involved in the law there, it wasn't just like one law. It was an incredibly complicated uh, set of interrelated laws uh, that established the system. And the court was met with one thing after another. And a lot of places in the South primarily didn't want to do it. And then they didn't. And then, how are we going to get them to do it? Well, I, President Eisenhower had a lot to do with that. I mean, he was right to send the paratroopers to uh, uh, Little Rock. But the court had one challenge after another, or one so, so it was a it was a court that was trying to work out because no one was helping it. I mean, Eisenhower did in '57, but Congress didn't pass anything. And uh, would people do it? 
And I think they were very much focused on that. And a lot of their, and uh, that, that single idea, here uh, equal protection of the laws is in the Constitution, and now we're going to see if the people do accept it or not. And, and that was uh, what happened at the court that, that my year there, 64, 65, and somewhat before, and probably somewhat after, is built around that idea. And uh, th there's no reason you have to have a court built around an idea that isn't better and it isn't worse. <laughs> and uh, later on, uh, things change. And uh, uh, since I've been on the court the 27 years, uh, uh, you sort of just did your job, decided the cases. Might not get them right. Do your best. <laughs> and there we are. But I can't say a single mission of any kind. And uh, probably the country might be better off for that. Because uh, I don't know exactly what it would be. But uh, that's a big difference. It's a big difference. Justice, one of the differences I see in that court is um, of the justices you named, only two I recall being court of appeals judges. Uh, it was a much more diverse court when we think of justice. Yes. Justice Douglas coming from the administrative uh, realm, uh, Justice Black being a senator. How do you think that affects the court in terms of the breadth of experience that that court had? It was a plus. I think it was a plus then, I think. But I mean, I wasn't privy to the conferences, really. Uh, but uh, the justice, I mean, remember again the mission. I mean, remember what they're trying to do. And I sometimes think or say, uh, when people say, oh, well, it's a good thing not to appoint a person with a political background, I think, really? I mean, suppose that uh, Chief Justice Warren had not been governor of California. Suppose he'd never had the experience of being nominated by both parties and, and overwhelmingly elected again and again. Uh, maybe they wouldn't have been able to get that uh, Brown versus Board written, or Cooper versus Aaron, or having gotten them written, figure out how to do their best as a court. You know, you can't do that much uh, to influence other people. To, but he, he had that experience. And I think probably at that time that was a plus. Now, one experience that that court did not have, and the current court did not have, but an intervening court did, was a judge from a state court. Justice no, that probably course. would have been helpful. I mean, a bre breadth of experience is helpful. I, I'm, I'm pretty sure. Uh, I can't prove it. Uh, but uh, Thurgood Marshall, supposedly, uh, would uh, somebody would say something, and he'd say, well, that is not what I've experienced. And, and he came from a background that had a pretty different experience. And he could use that and tell people about it. It would, it would help. Well, can we move to the present and how you go about doing your work? Uh, how do you prepare for, uh, for a case, for a decision of a case? You face some of the most uh, vexing legal issues that have divided lower courts. Uh, what is your process for once a case has been granted for review, for, uh, from the time the briefs arrive to the time the opinion Oh, issues? once we've granted review? Yes. OK, once we've granted review, you know, we're, we're, as you well know, we are, Probably about, what, 7,000 cases requesting review. That's about 150 a week or so. And they divide that among the law clerks, and they write memos. So I get a stack of memos like this, and I go through them pretty quickly and reduce them to the possibles, which are like that. And I said, well, how can you do that so quickly? I'd like people to think, oh, well, he's a genius. That's how he does it. It has nothing to do with that. <laughs> it has to do with the fact that we have a pretty good criteria. Is there a split among the circuits? If there is a split, if they've come, they're perfectly good judges in the circuits, you know, and everywhere else. I mean, but if there's no, so why if there's no split, would we take the case? Sometimes there's an answer to that, but not too often. But if there is a split, then the federal law, which is what we're deciding, or the constitutional law, is different in one place than another. So now we've taken the case, then what happens? So that, that's why I can do the possibles pretty quickly and give them back to my law clerks. And then uh, we'll discuss them like we just finished discussing them before I came over here. We're having conference tomorrow. Uh, the chief puts on any one, any one person can put on any case for discussion. And so the chief will send his list around. People add to that. And uh, uh, then uh, we just finish discussing the cases that are going to be discussed tomorrow. And we'll go around the room. And uh, four votes to grant is a grant. And there'll be a brief explanation by uh, anyone who 
Okay, now we've granted it. Then what happens? They start writing briefs. Why are they called brief? That is a mystery to me. <laughs> well, there we are. All right, so, so uh, uh, and, uh, you know, the, uh, then we'll get a stack. We got, I just finished uh, uh, reading uh, the briefs for these next two weeks that are coming up. You know, we have our oral arguments. The oral arguments are divided into two-week sessions, the first two weeks of October, November, December, January, the second two weeks of February, March, April. Uh, and in each of those oral sessions, it's Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and uh, then conference on Friday, sometimes conference on Wednesday afternoon. All right, there we are. So what do I do? I get the briefs, and I'll read them. This time it's not a memo, mm -hmm. uh, at least not yet. And uh, I'll go through them. And uh, I will, uh, usually I, I, I can read them in any order I want. So I'll, I'll, I'll sometimes normally read the opinion below first because someone's complaining about it. I don't always read the opinion below. I mean, it might say, we decide this because of the case of X, V, Y. I say, thank you, X, V, Y isn't even here, forget it. I'll go, to the, I'll go to the petitioner, what's the question, read the blue brief, that's blue, that's the petitioner, or, uh, um, Red brief is the uh, uh, respondent. Uh, the government might file a brief. It's always gray. Why is the government always gray? I don't know. And sometimes I'll read the solicitor general first, particularly if it's some complicated governmental thing, because they'll have talked to all the agencies and they'll understand it. So I go through these fairly quickly. And uh, then uh, the yellow brief. Actually, if I start with the SG, I might go to the yellow brief. The yellow brief is the reply brief. Why start with the reply brief? Because it'll say the same thing as the blue brief said, but more succinctly. That's why. <laughs> so so what, I'm try, what I'm trying to get in my mind is the structure. What is this argument? What are their points? And uh, 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 now when I've got that, I'll go to the uh, mic is curio. And there it depends. I'll read them in a sense. I mean, there are the light green ones for the blue side, and there are the dark green ones for the red side. Okay, so I may just go like that. And I may pick out the ones, you know, if it's a question of bankruptcy law, and there's some brief which has 19 bankruptcy professors on it, I might read that first, I admit it. Because <laughs> I, I, they'll have spent their lives in this, and I'd like to know what they think about it. And, and then I might go to some other group, and I might, but, but I'll, re, I'll go through all of them at least looking at the table of contents. And what I'm really looking for with the amicus briefs is I'm looking is are they going to tell me something that I haven't already heard? Like, for example, when we had the right to die case, you know, the right to assisted suicide? Well, it was great with the amicus briefs because there were about 80 amicus briefs, but they, they did the intelligent thing of getting different groups, like the nurses groups, the doctors, the hospice workers, and the nurses that were the ones who wanted the constitutional right to die and those that didn't. And the retarded people, the, 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 uh, all kinds of different groups. And what they told us was, if you decide this way, this is what's going to happen to people in our group. And you could say, well, that isn't relevant. But sometimes it is relevant. And it depends. And I want to know. And the worst kind of brief is, it's uh, the AFL-CIO. I'm not saying, you could be the Chamber of Commerce. They file a brief, and it opens up, and you read it, and then you know what it's going to say, because it's only four pages long, and it says, we're on the side of the plaintiff, or the petitioner. I say, thank you very much. That's incredibly helpful. <laughs> you know, I mean, so, so what I'm looking for with those amicus briefs is learning something. Now, probably, I can't read. I can't usually, I cannot do more than two cases a day. Uh, usually, if it's long and complicated, one. I'm not saying I do it tremendously thoroughly, but I don't. I want to walk away from that reading with a structure in my mind as to how, what this is about. And then I will talk to my law clerks. And they're dividing them up. And I say, well, this is just a tentative reaction. Don't take it as a given. I might come out right the other way. You now are going to read these with more care than I have, and you're going to write a memo, and I want to be sure that that memo answers this question. Da, 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 da. And I'll list three or four questions. And anything else you want. So if it's something that I've said, Jesus, this is, I'm sorry, I don't this question. I said, this is the worst statute I've ever seen. It's written with 14 they's in it, and you don't know who they refer to. I said, tell me which is which here. <laughs> 
<laughs> okay, uh, but if it's something that's uh, not like that, and most of them are not like that, uh, I'll, I'll have the structure, and then they will give me a memo. And the memo might be short. Sometimes they'll say, I, uh, we'll talk about it first, and I'll say, well, there's not much need here for much. Uh, or it might be long. I said, gee, I want to know the history of the uh, uh, tribal relationships to the, to the Department of the Interior on this particular question since the year two. Okay, I, I, I want to know who's right about that history there. Uh, did this British common law thing, uh, did it really, uh, was Blackstone say, really say that? And, and uh, sometimes I want to know that, and sometimes I won't. Sometimes I won't care. Okay, so they will produce a memo. Then I go through the memo before the oral argument. And then the oral argument, uh, see, I'll go with, with all the clerks. I want them all together. Yeah. Then I'm in the oral argument. Now, and what do you expect from counsel at oral argument? Oral argument, what I expect is that they will have a few minutes where they can say their main points. It's not really for them to make the points. Every one of us is thinking, I understand this case very well by the time we get into that oral argument. That was, uh, it used to be, it could be different. Learned Hand apparently did it differently. Frankfurter did it differently. Uh, they would really get the understanding from the oral argument. I don't think we do. And I don't think we have the last 27 years. I think we've walked in there. Sometimes our minds are changed about what we think. But we think we understand it. Okay. Then we see. <laughs> and we'll ask questions. And uh, the question, the, the half hour each side, or sometimes a little longer, is for us to ask questions. That's how we see it. You know, it's not for the lawyer to make his argument. He better have made it in the brief. And if it's something new, why didn't he put it in the brief? If it's new and important, then he should have put it in the brief. New and unimportant, who wants to listen to it? All right, so, so the, 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 the point is, it's really for us to ask the questions. And I think the best kind of question, which you try, is a question that I really don't know the answer to. I don't know. And I think the counsel may have learned more than me. And he may be able to give me a little help here. And I think that it is going to be important to the decision in the case. And that's why sometimes I've asked some pretty weird questions. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, 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 God, what were they? I think the worst one I asked was, we had some kind of a case about whether whether you could, it was like whether uh, you could have a color, could be a trademark. It was a bilious green color of a, of a dry cleaning pad. <laughs> and could that be the trademark? And like a shape, can a shape be a trademark? So I asked counsel, I, was, I thought it was relevant to ask whether a shape could be a trademark, and if so, when. So I said, suppose you had a comb in the shape of a grape. <laughs> he said, what? <laughs> yes. So, I mean, sometimes it doesn't work. But no, 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 no. nonetheless, those are the kinds of questions. And the worst kind of question is you're just bored and want to ask yourself a question. Uh, uh, and you can get into questions where you're taking the best argument of the other side or whatever and put it to these. But you probably know what they're going to say. And so what is really the point? And uh, uh, does your mind change in that oral argument? And the answer is yes. Sometimes it changes completely, not too often. You say, what, 5% if I were making a guess? But how you look at the case can change. There you get a higher number, 20%, 30, I don't know, 15, 20, somewhere in there. And that matters because the law and the way the bar and the lower courts and the bench and the, the uh, people who are interested will take it, those words matter what you write. And the way that you look at the case, the words you write are a function of how you're looking at the case and the different parts of it. And therefore, it matters, that oral argument. All right, after the oral argument, the next day or the two days after, we're in the conference room. All right, conference room, we're discussing, first of all, the four cases that we heard on Tuesday and Wednesday. Chief begins, as the issue in the case is da, 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 and each of us has a book. And in that book, we have the names of the one for each case and the names of all the other judges and the, the, uh, what we have to uh, uh, the space to write. And the chief will say, the issue in this case is us and so, and da, 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 and this is what I think about it. Probably five minutes, maybe 10, not much longer, uh, and this is why. Okay, then it goes, we go in order of seniority, and, and so therefore I will vote to reverse. 
that's usually obvious in what they say. We vote to affirm. Uh, this is all tentative, but it's getting less tentative all the time. And then we go to Clarence Thomas, and then to me now, and then to uh, Sam Alito, and then to uh, uh, Justice Sotomayor, Kagan, uh, Gorsuch, uh, uh, Kavanaugh, Barrett. And uh, nobody speaks twice till everybody speaks once. That is a very good rule for any small group. Because then nobody, I was a junior, I was the most junior judge for 11 years. I almost hold the world record. If only Alito, I thought of writing it, if he just only waited 10 days to take the oath, I could have done down as the 11 years and some days of being the junior judge, and I could have gone down in history as the answer to a trivia question. <laughs> <laughs> it would have been fabulous. But nonetheless, OK. I was, uh, but uh, we, then after everyone's spoken, there's some back and forth. And the back and forth works best. It doesn't always work this way. You get into a thing, as you know, if, you've, if you're in a, well, you're on appeals court, and it's a, there are only three, so it's uh, usually. But you try your, your uh, you know, on bank, yeah, God. It's, uh, 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 but, you know, if you start into the thing, I have a better argument than you do, forget it. When you say, I have a better argument than you do, the next person thinks I have a better argument than you do. And before you know it, everybody's trying to see who has the best argument, and each thinks he has the best argument or she, OK? So, so there we are. That doesn't get anywhere. But if you listen to what somebody else is saying, this I learned from Senator Kennedy when I worked there. I mean, you listen. And then eventually, they're likely, not always, but they're likely to say something that you might actually agree with. And then you say, ah, ah, maybe we can work with that. And that it's just, it's like, it's like in the oral argument. You know, if you've ever been to the Second Circuit, uh, where Learned Hand and Jerome V. Frank, I think, designed the courtroom, and it looks like a sitting room, it looks like somebody's living room. And the bench is right here, and the, it's about the same eye level as the uh, lawyers will be at when they're talking to the judges. And what you might help you get, which you like, is every so often, and you know it instantly, the lawyer maybe, not totally pretending, forgets that he's a lawyer for a client and says, this is what would really happen in the bankruptcy world if you do that. You know, and you get into a conversation, and there's a back and forth. And when that happens, it's really great, because you feel we're making progress here. This is just great. And uh, it doesn't happen too often, but sometimes it does. And, and sometimes that happens as well in the, in, in the discussion. And you feel, well, we're getting somewhere. All right, in any case, sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. And uh, on every, after the two weeks, is, uh, we've had, say, six cases or eight cases or 10 cases or something like that over the two-week period of the oral argument. And then the chief justice assigns who's going to write. Uh, the draft, if he's in the majority. Otherwise, the senior in, judge in the uh, uh, majority assigns the opinion. But the chief justice is, will normally assign it. But he's constrained. Okay, what is he constrained by? First, everybody has to get the same number, roughly, over the year. So everybody writes one, then everybody writes two, then everybody. Then he's constrained by the fact that, that he wants to get a majority. <laughs> and so if you have an outlying view, Forget it. You're not going to get assigned that because you won't pick up five people. I mean, the main thing is we've got to get five people on this decision. At least. We'd like nine. I once said that to Rehnquist. You didn't like my jokes in the conference. <laughs> but I said, you know, I've discovered how to get five people on an opinion. How's that? You start with nine. <laughs> that's, that's the, the, the all right, but, but, but uh, and, and he, 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 so he doesn't want an outlier. He wants to pick up the five, and he wants to give everybody one during that session. And before you know it, he no, doesn't have too much leeway as to how he is going to assign the opinion. Uh, but he will assign them, and then whoever's senior in the dissent will assign the dissent. But probably, normally, we used to be anyway, and I think it's probably still true, uh, we'd be... Uh, unanimous almost half the time. And the five, four decisions that everybody used to talk about were about, I don't know, 20%, 15%, sometimes a little more, sometimes a little less. Not the same five and the same four all the time. 
you can say 6'3 now, whatever, but it isn't. And uh, when I said 5'4, I said, one year I counted them, and uh, I wanted to find out. Uh, uh, for there, there were, I think there were 18 5 4 decisions or something like that. And 12 of the 5 4 decisions, 12 of those 18, were not what we would call the usual suspects. Okay? And I just had somebody look it up because every single time that they were written about in the press, it said, in an unusual combination. <laughs> so I said, how can it be an unusual combination? <laughs> and I said, well, I guess it could be, but I, I do you see. So, so uh, uh, it's, it's, not, uh, it's certainly not some cut and dried thing. And, and uh, uh, the breakdown conservatively, I mean, they occur in some cases, there's no question. But uh, perhaps fewer than people think. Oh. And, uh, there we are. So far right. If you want, well, a little story. I, the question is going to come right, from me today. Okay. And I, I give my law clerk gives me a draft. This is getting a little boring. It's very technical. All right. Anyway, my law clerk finally, after two or three weeks, gives me a draft of what's assigned to me. I take it. I go write my draft on the computer. I was a teacher for many years. I can't resist it. You know. <laughs> so then I write my draft. I give it back to her. She thinks hers is better. I say, maybe it was, but there we are. <laughs> and, and, and so then she'll produce another draft, and I produce another draft, and eventually we get something, and we send it around, and, and then I just hope for uh, uh, at least four others joining it, and, and uh, I'd like nine, but four will do. And, and they may have suggestions and the memos, and I may change it around somewhat. And uh, somebody can write a dissent, or somebody can write a concurrence, and eventually everybody's either written or joined. That's always the first thing in the conference. Is, is everybody written in this case? Everybody written? Then the case comes out. The end. There we are. Justice, one of the words I hear most frequently to describe you is pragmatic. And I wonder if, if assuming that's true, does that come from your days as an Eagle Scout or from reading William James or from life experience? And how does that affect your uh, approach to cases? William James is closer than the Eagle Scout. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, uh, it's, uh, it's a special kind of pragmatism. I mean, if you're, I did, when I was an undergraduate, I, I studied, uh, I majored in philosophy at Stanford and in England, too. And at that time, people were, well, the philosopher at Harvard was Quine, and there's a, there's, a, there's a list of philosophers. And I'm saying this for a reason. I mean, it's before William James was Peirce. It was Peirce, James, Quine. And the kind of thing that pragmatism doesn't quite catch it. Yeah, it's a certain kind of pragmatism. But um, so Klein had this, so people have all kinds of systems in their minds, all kinds. And that's how we function during a day or a week or a month. And uh, you could change certain beliefs that you have, but then there'd be implications for other beliefs. And there'd be implications over here, and there'd be implications over there. And if you're going to change too much too fast, you would discover all kinds of things you had to change, unless you decide to change the rule of logic itself, and then, my God, where would we be? Mm -hmm. And law is not that different, in, in my opinion. It's not that different. So when you say pragmatism, you have to take into account such things as, what does this do to the rule of, and now put in a principle? or an approach, or a standard, or a statutory word, or a canon, if you like. I have never been a great fond of canons since I read, I was it Carl Llewellyn, who somebody wrote, there's a, every canon, there's a counter canon, you know, look before you leap, who, he who hesitates is lost, or whatever. I mean, <laughs> I mean you know, it's, there, there is a certain, but, but all of those things, law is a complicated business, and there are systems, and there are approaches, and there are rules for dealing with rules, and they aren't quite rules, and, and, it's in, and so what you do is figure out not just what would be nice in the world? Absolutely not. But that's a point. And so how does it react? with? It? That's why you have to accept cases that you really don't like. If you had been on this court before, you might never have done it. But, but, there it is. And think about that. And it isn't just one thing. 
It's like 20 things. And what is the client going to learn from the, from the, uh, uh, from the lawyer? And what, so you can go on endlessly to the point where you'd never be able to get a decision written. But, but the, 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 the fact is that there are, in particular cases, uh, canons or rules or statutes or all the things you learn in law school and the things you learn through experience and lots and lots of different systems and things and approaches, da 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 And to take some of those into account, I think it's absolutely necessary, and I think people either do it or they don't. Nobody does it. No. They either tell you what they're doing or they don't. And that, I think, is more like the case. So I say, yeah, I admit I'm doing that, and when I do it, I say it. And then if people don't want to th think I'm doing it wrong, say I'm doing it wrong. And the next judge will learn something better. You know? So, so uh, we're in a complicated business. Uh, and there we are. Uh, but we like it. <laughs> and that's not just the judges. The lawyers rather like it too, and the teachers, and it's interesting. Well, Justice, we're in the library, so why don't we talk about a few of your books? Oh. And <laughs> Uh, I'd like to start with Making Our Democracy Work. This is a book, A Judge's View. Uh, and you talk about the operation of the court in this book. Uh, but one of the points you make is the importance of identifying rights and also uh, proportionality in interpreting the Bill of Rights and how identifying values and proportionality is important to resolving disputes over uh, individual rights. Would you like to say a few words about that? Well, it depends on the right. I mean, or it depends on what the, if it says two senators, it means two. Yeah. But the freedom of speech doesn't quite define itself. You well know that. And, uh, and that's what Black said. Black said, no law, no law. Congress will make no law uh, abridging the freedom of speech. He says, no law means no law. I say, yes, that's true. Go over with Justice Black. No law means no law. But the freedom of speech, as he said, doesn't quite define it. And so there, there, there are at all kinds of levels disagreement there. Uh, what? To what extent should you try to create rules as opposed to approaches, as opposed to strict scrutiny, intermediate scrutiny, little scrutiny? <laughs> uh, does it, are those rules? Are they approaches? Are they like stoplights, green, yellow, red? What are they like? And uh, people can have a hard time. And so my own view, my own view, and why I say that there, is yes, uh, those approaches, uh, green, yellow, red, if you like, uh, will answer some questions for you. Usually not the questions that we get, sometimes, but not too often. Uh, and rather, when people get into that, what they do, whatever color light they're using, they ask somewhat similar questions at least to themselves. And they'll say, how does this really affect speech? And what kind of speech? And is it that kind that helps create well-known marketplace of ideas or helps transmit those ideas to those in the government who could act on them? And to what extent will this hurt? And what's the reason for this rule which seems to hurt some, a lot? Hmm. And are there other ways of going about it? By now, it's absolutely familiar. Because although those three parts are uh, well known. Sometimes the court refers to them and sometimes not. And, and uh, uh, I thought they worked pretty well with gun control when I was, I thought with uh, gun control you want, and you see because ultimately judges, Frankfurter said this, he said judges like when they're implying a balancing test, they like a balancing test to work so that everything's on one side. <laughs> then they can't be criticized, you see. And then they get the answer pretty easily. But sometimes it isn't. And when it isn't on one side, there is some weighing going on. And that's why I've used that word proportionality. Because I think that captures what actually goes on in the judge's mind, and should. Sometimes better than saying we're using this test or that test. I'm not against saying we're using this test or that. I sometimes am, but, but, not, not, uh, but I am uh, in favor of saying, well, this is why I think it would be a disproportionate injury to the freedom of speech if, if you didn't let 
use an old case that I dissented in. <laughs> if you didn't let this uh, retired administrative law judge teach the Kurds uh, in Turkey uh, how to petition the United Nations for a redress of grievances, <laughs> rather than call it a violation of a statute which forbids you to give aid to uh, a group of people on the State Department's terrorist list. You can look that up if you want. <laughs> okay. But uh, 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 so in many of these things, I think you know, it's, it, the cases are fine in the center, uh, and there are not too many that are, really. Uh, and as you get towards the edges of these things, I mean by edges, it's blurred, it's uncertain, it's much rather hard. I think you often do get into a weighing process, and I think th that kind of weighing, which consists of the harm to the protected interest, the need for that harm, and the possibility of less restrictive alternatives in some form or other is, uh, are usually helpful questions to ask aloud so that the public knows what you're doing. I'd like to turn to another one of your books. This is Active Liberty, Interpreting Our Democratic Constitution. And I guess my takeaways from this book, the general takeaways, is first that the court should consider the democratic underpinnings of the Constitution when interpreting it. And second, that the people have a responsibility to participate in those institutions uh, to make democracy work. Is that a fair description? Oh, absolutely, and I think it's more I use it now. What I do when I'm talking to high school students, and I would urge you to do that, or, or talk to college students, and you all do that, and it would be, here's one of the things I try to work in is this. I, I always usually have a copy of the documents, because that gets their attention. And uh, I say, this document, I say an awful lot of people, uh, of course it's important, it helps uh, keep us together as a nation of 331 million people who disagree about everything. And uh, I said, but it helps keeps us together as a nation. And I'd say, but if I want to think of how to describe it to a high school, the high school students, I think when I was in high school, I used to listen to a radio program, and it was called the Sergeant Preston of the Yukon. And Sergeant Preston was out there in northwest Canada, uh, near Alaska, patrolling the borders. And life was tough on the borders, very tough. Uh, but he was part of the border patrol. And this sets borders. I say, it doesn't really tell you what to do, occasionally it does, but some of those border questions are pretty tough. Is abortion inside or outside and so forth? You know, you can think of tough questions. But basically, it's a boundary setting document, and that boundary setting document is a boundary set that tries to leave lots of things, vast numbers, the vast majority of things, up to the public to decide through democratic processes. And to think of that sometimes helps you when you're trying to interpret the freedom of speech and whether the need for transmission to government officials. And sometimes it's just a way of looking at the document, but that's what it is. And uh, so within those boundaries, which are very broad indeed, it's up to the cities, the states, the towns, the counties, the nation, to decide through democratic processes what kind of uh, government they want. And I say, as long as you understand that, I'm now talking to high school students, you will also understand why John Adams and the others thought, hey, we can't tell you much about how to lead your life. It's a graduation. Now, this is good. A lot of you will be asked to give graduation speeches, so I might as well tell you what I usually <laughs> And this is always works. <laughs> you say, you say uh, 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 well, I can't tell you how you're going to lead your life. I hope that uh, you find someone to love. I hope that you have a rewarding uh, career. And I hope that you participate in public life, at least by voting. But there are a thousand different ways. A library commission, I don't care, a school board, whatever. They need people in San Francisco at the moment. But the, 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 <laughs> the uh, 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 but uh, participate. And I can tell you one thing from my experience. I think that John Adams and the others were right about this. Uh, if you don't participate, this document won't work. Because it is a document that foresees your participation in a democratic government as essential to the experiment that is this country. OK? And that's what I want them to take in. Because now I'll say, you know, being a little older, I can say to them, and by the way, it's up to you now. 
It's up to you, my friends. If you don't like what that person doesn't say, has been saying, go talk to him. Okay, anyway, you see the point. And, and so, of course, I think this is. Well, Justice, you mentioned you were a law professor. I happen to have the case book that you authored here. That's not on sale at the Supreme Court historically. Why not? That's <laughs> terrible. These are great cases written. <laughs> but it, it brings up the question of the academy, the legal academy. Is it doing its job well? Uh, yeah, pretty well. I think uh, what we are, uh, and it used to be true, and I hope it remains true, is that we have three parts, if you want, to our profession. Uh, the, the, from a looked at from the point of view of the judge, my job is to decide cases, but I'm not going to know enough to know how those cases, which work out, which don't work out, and so the academy tries to put them together into some kind of coherent whole, and then they write articles about it, or they write treatises, or they uh, uh, teach their classes, and, and the, the bar has an opportunity to read what they write. And uh, the bar will then, when they find something useful, uh, let us know <laughs> in the next case, at least if it favors them. <laughs> but there are two sides, and uh, so we'll get to know. And then we maybe can write a better opinion. And then we go through the process again. Now, I think that is a traditional, that is a traditional role for the, the academy. They have other roles, too, of course. But uh, that is one that's important. So I'm glad when they write treatises, and I, I'm glad when the American Law Institute gets everybody together and tries to figure out what, you know, the law of stoppage in transit to or something. I mean, that's, we could have a case in that, state courts will. But in any case, you see, that, 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 that sort of cycle, I think, is important. Another book that you've written is The Court and the World, uh, addressing the, uh, the change in our global environment, where more and more cases before the court uh, involve international uh, yeah, issues. And one chapter of that book talks about the judge as diplomat. And you have been engaged in a number of judicial exchanges. You've spoken to around the world on subjects of law. Would you like to talk a bit about the, the role of the judge in that respect, in terms of promoting rule of law through in the international community? Well, the main rule, uh, I don't know. I, I thought. Uh, I, I think it's a useful thing to do, but uh, it's, it's, uh, you don't have to convince judges that a rule of law is important. I mean, sure, they think that. Nor lawyers, they make their living out of that, too. Uh, the people you have to convince, and this is what I said to the, once to the uh, Chief Justice of Ghana, who was trying, she was trying to produce a, a better legal system there. Rule of law, is a, that, that's what that book is really about. I mean, why do people, that's what she asked me, why do people do what you say? And that's a very good question with a very, very long set of answers that don't really answer it. And time, and 200 years, and lots of cases, and all kinds of things that happen. And, and that's what I, I think is important. When you meet the judges from other countries, it's, it's helpful because at least you know each other exist. And sometimes they'll write something that's quite useful for the case in front of you. More often not, but sometimes. And where judges have, uh, after all, the same kind of document we have, like the Constitution, and the same kind of job, and more and more of the same kinds of problems, we might learn something from that. We don't have to follow it. But sometimes it's useful. So all, I think all of those things, I put some examples in there of where I found it useful. But I think the main thing now is to understand how, even if you never set foot outside the country, uh, it's still, this world has changed. And it will change more. And uh, what do I mean by that? Well, we had a case, and I put this in there because I, I thought it was so interesting. A, a, um, uh, a student in physics, I think, or science uh, from uh, Thailand was studying at Cornell and he discovered that his physics text, or whatever it was, was published in Bangkok at a lower price, in English, quite a lot lower. So he, he wrote to his parents and said, send me a few, and they sent more than a few. <laughs> and, and so the publisher got a little annoyed and sued him. And the, the question was whether or not uh, he could uh, uh, bring copies into the United States from Thailand at a lower price and sell them. 
uh, even for this copyrighted uh, book. And uh, forget what the answer was. I don't forget, but I mean, that's not the important thing. To me, the important thing is that it is a very complicated statute and really hard to understand the part that was relevant to this. And yet we received, on what seemed an awfully technical thing, a bunch of amicus briefs like this from all over the place. And I didn't understand why are there so many people writing on this case? And then I sound, found finally in one of them what I thought was the answer to that question, or and in effect said to, said to the judges, you realize that your answer to this question is going to affect $3 trillion worth of commerce? Now, that's the world today. And that isn't going to go away. And we had a very interesting case where Nino and I were absolutely seeing eye to eye on a question that came out of Australia uh, about securities. And could a person, an Australian, sue in New York uh, uh, for, uh, as a result of uh, what he thought was uh, shares in a company sold in Australia over the Australian Stock Exchange? But that company had bought a company in Miami and uh, the claim of the plaintiff was it's exaggerated the value to the Australians. Does our securities law cover that? Well, we thought, no. That's up to the Australians. And in writing that, when Nina wrote it, I think I wrote something, but I'm not sure. But um, uh, I thought, because I had to read a few of the older cases, if Henry Friendly had been deciding that case, then when he decided other cases like that, he would have said we were wrong. And he, in effect, did. But what we had today, which he wouldn't have had 30 years ago, is we had briefs from the EU. We had briefs from the Australians. We had briefs from all over the place, mostly sent in by securities administrators who said, leave us alone. We are trying to enforce disclosure laws not that different from yours. Because even in our country, we do not like fraud. <laughs> and uh, don't interfere. You will cause more trouble than you think. And uh, you see, what does that to me reflect? Quite a difference in the world. And you can find cases in the environment. You can find cases in, in uh, uh, securities law. You can find cases in commerce. You can find them in diseases. You can find them all over the place where it's useful not absolutely required, but very useful to know what's happening outside our own boundaries. And so be careful. It's, I mean, uh, what I'd like to think of is, is when you decide, judge, even in a civil liberties case, think of your decision as setting a principle that might be followed in Spain or Belgium by other judges and try to get it all to work out so that uh, South Africa doesn't have to file a brief, as they did, in a case where a civil liberties group was suing a company for having done business in South Africa uh, under apartheid, uh, under the, uh, you know, what's that act, the Alien Tort Statute. Uh, and uh, South Africa files a brief, today's government, you know, I mean, uh, it was uh, actually, what's his name? Uh, uh, great patriot in South Africa. Uh, Nelson Mandela? Yeah, Mandela. Mandela's government. Uh, they filed a brief. Uh, and they said, stay out of this. We have a system in South Africa. It's called truth and reconciliation. And we do not believe that courts in the state of New York are going to contribute to what we're trying to do. Is that? Now, that is the world that we are in, and it will become more so. So it's worth at least thinking about these problems uh, when uh, cases that reflect them come up. You know, a number of foreign countries have court systems in which they have separated the constitutional function from the statutory function. They have separate constitutional yeah. courts. Uh, what's your, your view on that? No, it may suit them, but I don't think it would be good for us. I, th I think the more we're, uh, the, the more the, our Supreme Courts and, and the states or, the, or our Supreme Court or the other courts, courts of appeals, are involved in what I call the day-to-day -day, uh, uh, commercial law, uh, lots of other kinds of law, uh, good. 
because we understand that we're not in some special constitutional universe and that things uh, have to more or less uh, work out uh, for the public uh, in ways that involve both constitutional law and uh, more uh, typical statutory or sure. even common law issues. Sure. Maybe we can turn to your most recent book, uh, and that again is The Authority of the Court in the Peril of Politics. And I think part of the theme of this book is that there are steps that both the court and the public can take to ensure that there are good boundaries between their, their respective spheres. And I think you point to, to five factors you think the court can exercise in, in order to better secure uh, democratic values. I think you begin with just do the job. Would you like to expand on that? Well, it, what, what this is addressing, basically, I want to I want to show here. So, I mean, everybody understands that this is a difficult time, uh, both politically and and in terms of people disagreeing with each other uh, in the country. And and so, uh, uh, what I'm saying here is, I want I want those who are willing to read this, uh, particularly it's not particularly aimed at lawyers, maybe aimed at law students. Uh, to understand that the rule of law is an important thing. Uh, it has helped keep the country together, and it isn't something that just say, just say it, and it happens. It takes, as I said, 150 years, and I go back with examples when it did and didn't happen, and, and it's a very long, complicated thing. And ultimately, I said to the woman from Ghana, uh, you have to convince the people in the villages, in the town. And it's in their interest sometimes, generally, to follow decisions that they don't like, that may ha hurt them, affect them adversely. And by the way, it might be wrong, because if we're five to four, somebody's wrong. Okay? And why is that a good thing to do? And they have to understand that. And, and uh, there is a period right now it's a, that I think it's a difficult in that respect, difficult to get people. So I say, what can we do about that? And what I'm really saying is not much. I say the main thing is you do your job. That's it. That's what my father used to tell me. He had two important pieces of advice before he died. That was the second one. The second one is do your job. And the first one was stay on the payroll. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Well, you, right, but the, the, you, you see? Yeah. Uh, and uh, you, you do try to just do your job. And, uh, you would, and uh, the others are, are sort of try to, to, to work out differences, etc. They're fairly trite. They're fairly trite. But they're sometimes uh, helpful for inside the court. And outside the court, it's even more trite. I mean, it's what Sandra O'Connor thought. And, and, uh, and others. Uh, it's why I like the chance to talk to the high school students and the others, college students. Or, it's up to you. Listen. You don't like what other someone else is saying, then go talk to them. You know? Don't sit there and just mope. And you better know how the country works. You better know what's in this document the Constitution. And you better know how Congress does work and your state legislature and your city council and your board of education and the Supreme Court too. Learn something about it. It used to be called 12th grade civics. And uh, why that isn't taught everywhere, I just can't understand it. Uh, but if it isn't, you're going to have people who grow up. That's what I tell my grandchildren. You're going to grow up knowing about nothing but aliens invading us from outer space, you know. I mean, <laughs> yeah, shoot please, uh, let's, uh, okay. You see, that's, that's, that's the reason. I have one last question for you, uh, Justice uh, Breyer. When you announced your retirement uh, a few weeks back, uh, you made a very optimistic statement about being on the bench and looking out at the audience uh, at oral argument and seeing people of every race, color, creed, and belief and yet all of them united in a faith in the rule of law. And I think that's a very optimistic. Or at least they're willing. willing. Let's not get overdone. I want overdone enough. Yes. Yeah. But, but I mean, at least they're willing to resolve these major differences under law. And they will come in. Well, 
when you are off the bench and looking up at the bench, what do you hope to see there? I hope to see there people who are looking down and seeing the same thing I've seen for 27 <laughs> years. That's, that's what I hope. I certainly hope that. Uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's true. I think that is the, that is the challenge. And, uh, uh, well, we're going to relish I mean, seeing you on the bench for these last couple of months, and I'm sure attorneys will be fully engaged with your questions and look forward to, you, to your, your work on the court. Uh, I want to thank you so much for spending time, this time with us for the Fellows Program and say what a delight it is to, to have this chance to talk with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.